I've got a question for you before I begin the message this morning. <clears throat> Is there anywhere found in the Bible even an indication of how long a church service is supposed to last? No. no. Are you sure? <laughs> Can you think about anywhere in the scriptures where it tells us how long a church service is supposed to last? Tell it ends. Huh? Tell it ends. <laughs> Till what? Till it ends. They fall out the window. Till it. <laughs> Till they fall out the window. <laughs> Excellent answer, brother. You got. You're on top of it. If you don't know what that means, so Paul was in Troas preaching, and uh, he was the third story, and church began somewhere around five or six o'clock in the evening in those days. And this was now past midnight and Paul was still preaching. He fell asleep off the windowsill and fell down three stories, broke his neck, killed him. <laughs> they ran upstairs and said, Paul, Paul, don't interrupt me, I'm preaching. And when the guy just fell out the window, he's dead. Well, leave him dead. We'll take care of him later. If he's dead, he's dead. Paul went and preached all night. That service lasted from sundown to sunrise. And when Paul got finished preaching, thank you very much, he went down and laid <coughs> on him and rose him from the dead. And pointed his finger in his nose and said, next time I dare you to fall asleep on my sermon. Is there anywhere in the scriptures where it tells us how long a service is supposed to be? According to Daryl, usually it's when his stomach is loud enough screaming for food. <laughs> usually. <laughs> how long is a service supposed to last? How many know that sometimes we inhibit and we stifle, and I would declare, even grieve the Holy Spirit by, by our traditions. We come into the service and we say, God, you've got an hour to bless me. If you don't bless me in an hour, you fail. You got an hour to do it? We start at 11, God, our service, and we're done at noon. You know that. That's our tradition, God. you got an hour. See what you can do in an hour. And put a, put a rush on that, Lord, will you? Let's go ahead and put a rush on that. Because, you know, at lunchtime, we have to beat the Methodists to the restaurant. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to wait a long time to eat. Our traditions dictate to God how long the service is going to be. Huh? I know when I went to Africa, those services lasted a long time. <laughs> they had no beginning and they had, they had no beginning, but no end. <laughs> no end. How long is a service supposed to last? <laughs> there is no scripture anywhere that tells Christians how long a service is supposed to last. No end. I feel that it's incumbent upon the church, the believers, to liberate themselves, free themselves from those weights that tie them down. Let me tell you something about Diane. Uh oh. Here we go. <laughs> when it comes to her plate, her food, don't mess with her food. <laughs> Once in a while, I think she's done and out of the kindness and generosity of my heart, I go to take her plate off the table to, she said, what are you doing, but put it back here. Where are you going with my plate? Where are you going with my, I'm not done. 
Well, it looked like you're, I'm not done yet. I'll let you know when I'm done. Don't mess with my plate. Crack that wheel. I've learned my lesson. You know how cats can take their time to eat and lick up and just cats take their time to eat. Dogs gulp. Dogs don't eat. They inhale their food. You notice that? A dog just is disappeared inside of a second. A dog is gone. As a matter of fact, he's looking to eat the bowl. That's how stupid a dog is. He doesn't know when to quit. When it comes to a cat, can't you read? On the cat it says gourmet. You don't rush gourmet meal. This isn't fast food. This is gourmet cat food. You take your turn. You enjoy the meal. I have put my white paws on just to eat right. I have groomed myself before dinner. Dog comes to eat stinking. But a cat will groom itself. It'll lick its paws. It'll... Nice right ready. It comes prepared. And don't mess with her food. Just like Diane. Don't mess. Be very careful. If you ever go to eat with Diane, stay away from her plate. Because that is, that is her sacred, sacred blessing. It gets dangerous. It could be very dangerous. For your own health and safety, do not mess with her plate. Never said that. All that say this. I think when it comes to when God is serving up his meal, Should we not be like the cats and take your time? Get all that God has for you. This is not a fast food restaurant. This is not fast food feeding frenzy. Services in the New Testament could last upwards of 12 hours. then freshen up just to go to work next morning. <clears throat> I think that the church, for it to finally come and rise to its level of divine destiny, must secure a more sophisticated spiritual palate and learn how to eat have some table manners if you come to Calvary Community Church and say pastor God and you have an hour bless me because I have things to do you may leave before the meal is through I want to be done when the Holy Ghost is done. Amen. And until then, like Diane, don't mess with my message. Amen. I'm feeding, thank you very much. And I want you today to begin to pray and ask the Lord to strengthen you. Ask the Lord to change your thought patterns. I think Calvary Community Church as a body of believers would do well not to be constricted when it comes to the word when it comes to worship when it comes to the Lord's table when it comes to fellowship with the saints when it comes to prayer when it comes to the things of the kingdom of God, as the deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth after thee.
I felt that I needed to share this preamble of a message today with you. I believe it's a preconditioning situation by the Holy Spirit here at Calvary Community Church. Pastor, you're getting ready to extend the service till 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I have no plans on doing that. But if I had a way, if I had a means, if I had a plan or a technique that I could blow up your anxieties concerning let out time, I would blow it up. That has to be broken. And the best way to do that is to submit that to the Holy Spirit. And say, God, help me to understand that God is not Wendy's. It's not McDonald's. God is not Hardy's. He's not Arby's. God does not have drive through window service. Amen. Amen. I believe that God has such riches to offer us. Because I often wonder, remember I've told you recently that time for me is rushing by more quickly than I really would like for it to. And it's the same thing with our church service. Same thing with our church service. Seems like we just get started, Brother Charlie, as Carol Burnett would say, and it's already time to say goodbye. The time just was flying by, and I kept asking, hey, baby, good to see you, darling. Good to see you this morning. <clears throat> My mother would tell me, when I asked her, why do summers go by so fast, and school drags on forever? Yes. Amen. <laughs> yeah. She said, because summers you're enjoying and you're lapping it up, you're soaking it in, and you're basking in the joy of life. And when you're having a good time, time flies by. <coughs> well, the last 20 years must have been hilarious for me. Because, boy, I'll tell you what, it has come and gone. I must, say, I must have lived nothing but hilarity for the last 20 years. I've been in South Carolina for 30 years. Been in Columbia 20. I can't tell you where that time has gone. When I come to the church, these are the fastest moments of all time and eternity. Right here in this building, when we come together, and we're blessed with our fellowship. We sang this morning together again. We shook hands and we were blessed in our time of gathering and fellowship together. How, how blessed we are to have that sense. And I want to just encourage you to begin to think in terms of let God have his way. Amen. Give God your time. Don't rush God. Don't rush what God wants to do. Don't push God, shove God into hurrying Him up and what He needs to do. Stop thinking in terms of putting chronos in the Greek, time limits on God. And turn God loose, setting free in your life and in the service. I'm never in a hurry to leave you. There is nothing out there that I would rather be doing than being here with you. It feeds the soul. Now, can I preach? Mark chapter 7. We're going to talk about a liberating touch this morning. 
a liberating touch of God. I've been on a series of messages called the touch of God. Huh? Verse. Huh? Verse. What verse? Oh, you want that too? <laughs> then Unless you're going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to be in verse 31. Mark chapter 7, beginning <coughs> at verse 31. On down to verse 37. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. By the way, those of you going to Israel with us in April of next year, you're going to visit these places that we're reading about here. <coughs> then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. Basically deaf and dumb. And they begged Jesus to put his hand on him. Everybody say hand on him. Hand on him. Uh -huh. Now watch what Jesus does. He takes him aside from the multitude. Puts his fingers in his ears. And then he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephratha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed. And he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. <laughs> and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And I want to reiterate, He has done all things well. Amen. Let's recite it together. He has done all things well. Jesus does everything good. Jesus does all things well. When God does something, it's always a good job. Yes. Amen. He never begins what he doesn't plan on ending and completing. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God began the life of God, the life of the Spirit, the purposes of God in the church. And he viewed and showed on the Isle of Patmos, John the Revelator, things to come. And he showed us the condition of the church in heaven. Showed us the situation in heaven. And he saw, he saw the innumerable numbers of people that were praising and worshiping God. He said it sounded like thunder. Because the numbers were innumerable like the sands of the ocean. So regardless of how you assess the condition of the church today in the world, God is still working in his church. Amen. And he is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. I'm coming down at you now. Grab the handheld, that battery is going out. Huh? Grab the handheld, your battery is going out. Grab the handheld. I'm glad we have options. Yeah. I'm going to turn this one off. Jesus <clears throat> is finishing some ministry. And now he's moving on to his next ministerial outreach area. Decapolis is about the Gennesaret area. You remember the man that was possessed of a legion of demons and delivered. Remember, they went into a, a 2,000 uh, swine and they all went into the river and, and they all drowned. <clears throat> they didn't have barbecue that day, I'm sorry. It just, there was nothing going on. <clears throat> this was the same area. Jesus was going by there and both of you, once again, going to Israel with us. I hope you decide to come with us. This 10-day trip in April of next year, you, I'm going to show you where that's at. Because we go to Capernaum, because this is just before you get to Capernaum, all right? Where Peter's mother-in-law's house and where Peter's house was. <clears throat> so he comes into that area, and the multitudes are already there, and then there's a man who is deaf and a mute. And he's been that way. I'm not sure if he was totally deaf and a total mute, but obviously Jesus had to deal with both issues. 
And I want to draw you the picture and the similitude and also the parallels here. And also show you some very important, very important principles. When Jesus was requested to look at this man and heal him of his deafness and muteness, mute condition, what did Jesus do? He took him aside from the crowds. Why didn't he just do it in front of everybody? There are a couple of reasons. Number one, do you remember when the little girl had already died in the house and there was a bunch of mourners there and Jesus said, clear the house. Get everybody out of here. There's a reason why God, a couple of reasons why God pulls us aside when he's about to do something special in our lives. He may pull you out from your family. He may pull you out from your surroundings. He may pull you out of your comfort zone. He may pull you out of your uh, familiar surroundings in terms of your, your, your peers and so on and people that you're accustomed to hang out with. And he'll pull you aside with because sometimes in the crowds you have people that are anti-Christ. Right. People who are anti-faith. People who are antagonistic, people who are agnostic, people who are doubters, curious people, to curiosity brings them out. There are people in, of every thought in a crowd. That's one reason that God wants to pull you to put you into a sphere, an atmosphere of faith. To pull you away from those who could have an influence on your on your faith. See, sometimes when you want to reach out and be touched by the Lord, Satan's going to have his playmates out there, and they're going to try maybe to discourage you from seeking the Lord. They may try to discourage you from believing God for your miracle. They may discourage you. They may say, well, let's just wait. We talked about it in the class, Brother John, this, this morning. God has to remove what seems to be the intellectual uh, intellectual intellectual uh, logic and assumptions so that so we don't lean on our own understanding but that we would look to him in all things concerning his will his purpose and his guidance in our life Amen. secondly when god pulls you it was when god's about to do something special in your life he will separate you for the second reason and that is to show you that this jesus we're talking about is a very personal Jesus. Amen. When Jesus deals with you, he deals with you one on one. How many glad for that this morning? Amen. Jesus deals with you one on one. Yes, yes. The message he has for your life will be a little different than Michelle's, a little different than Tony's, a little different from Megan and Gary and the rest of them. When God deals with you, he will deal a tailor made message because you have your own structure your own situations that you're facing and dealing with and things that you're facing in life may be different than others and so he pulls you aside because he is a personal savior he is a one-on-one -on -one personal god he is one that wants to uh, to to tend watch now he's one he's a good shepherd that wants to tend to that one little sheep that one little lamb Huh? Not that he's abandoned the 99, but he's going to pay personal attention, give personal attention to each individual who will come. Somebody shout praise the Lord. If you come to Jesus, he will give you one-on-one -on -one personal attention. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then what's the next thing that he did? He looked up toward heaven. Jesus, now why did he do that? He, the Lord looked to heaven to let this man know that all good gifts are from above. That your heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you ask Him. Even Jesus Himself will point the way to Almighty God. He will help you to look upwards. He will help you to understand that He is anxious to lift you and raise you up into heavenly places with Him. This man had a greater need than 
his deaf ears to be open and his tongue to be loose. That's it. That's right. This man had to find God. Yes. This man had to come into right standing with God. He wanted to point this man toward heaven to be able to see the vastness of God's glory and his power and his majesty. And every time that God deals with us one on one, he's always going to point you toward heaven, toward where the heavenly father is, where all things are in brightness and in glory and majesty and in splendor. All things that come from God to pour into you come from our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, your Father knows what you have need of before you even ask Him. Amen. So Father is going to point you toward, uh, Jesus is going to point you toward the Father. So he lifted up his eyes and he said, look up, look up, son, look up. And I'm sure he couldn't understand, maybe he read the lips, but he said, yeah. <laughs> We're going to pray. God. <coughs> our heart will pray God. Yes. God is going to hear you. <laughs> I'm not into sign language. I won't have the first clue. You're doing good. I'm doing, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing good. God is going to hear you. Yes. You may be deaf. You may be mute. You may not be able to speak. You may not be able to articulate. You may not be able to plainly explain and plainly speak and express yourself as you'd like to. But how many know that God hears the faintest cry? That's right. Amen. He hears deeply into the heart. When you cannot articulate and verbalize, when you cannot audibly speak, when you are so dumbfounded in life, God is able to hear your heart's cry. He's Man. able to hear when your spirit is moaning and groaning and asking for God's intervention. Even before you even you speak a word of prayer, God is already in tune with your heart. He's in tune with your need. He's in tune with where you are in life and what the condition of your soul is. Yes. Yes. And then the Lord moves into his act. I want to see if I have enough battery in this one and put this down for a second. Give me some water on this or whatever. So the Lord came and physically came and he put his fingers in the man's ear. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. He put his fingers in the man's ears. And he said, Be open! Wow. And then I'm not going to do the next thing. But you know what Jesus did? He spit on his fingers and touched his lips and his tongue. How many of that's pretty intimate? Amen. How many would like to have Jesus spit and touch your lips? Amen. Anybody interested in getting in line? <laughs> and <I'm, laughs> she'd knock them down just to be in line ahead of you. How would you like Jesus to touch you with his own lips, with his own mouth, his own saliva, and touch your mouth? This speaks to me, this speaks to me of a liberating touch. Yes. When Jesus touches your ears, your mouth, you see things differently in life. Yes. When this man received his hearing and his mouth was loosened, he began to speak plainly. Then he said to him, Because now that you have a mouth, you may become a motor mouth.
How many know when the Lord touches you? My wife calls it the mouth of the south. When God touches you, motor mouth of the south. People wonder why I always talk about Jesus. Well, I've got God's saliva in my mouth. Amen. I don't preach, Don. Don, what do you think? Yes, yes, yes. How about saying an amen on that? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Back that a second that day. Amen. amen. Why do I like to preach? Why do I like to speak? I may be in the mall. I might be in a restaurant. I might be, you know, just anywhere. And I start to talk. Diane just walks away. <laughs> she goes on shopping at Bell's. She says, I have shopping to do. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> she turns me loose. And by the time she's done shopping, she comes back. I'm still preaching. I'm still talking. But you see, I have divine saliva in my mouth. Mm -hmm. You know that lady that says, I fell and I can't get up? Well, I, you got me a shirt. How many years ago was that, guys? Those of you remember? Hal and Kathy. Hal and Kathy. They, they, remember that they bought me a shirt I started to preach and said, Ray I started to preach and I can't stop, Pastor Gilbelly. They actually made me a shirt. <laughs> they made me a shirt like that, Brother Charlie. I started to preach and I can't stop, Pastor Gilbelly. He even put my name on it. I have become the motor mouth of the South. But you see, the thing of it is, I have saliva from God in my mouth. And Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones and I can't hold back. Amen. You see, when you get a, uh, an experience, when you have an encounter with Jesus and he puts his saliva, his finger on your lips, on your tongue, he loosens your mouth. Because now you have something worth speaking. Amen. Now listen. Third issue, third point about this message is the spiritual aspect of it. You can't speak what you can't hear. Amen. Amen. But David, did not Jesus say, my sheep know my voice. My, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger, they, uh-huh. And then, in Revelation's first three chapters, repeatedly, he said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Say with me, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, what the Spirit says to the church. Says to the, church. the spiritual significance of this miracle is the liberating power of the touch of God in your life to where you begin to hear from God. And if you're not sure what you're hearing is from God or not, ask me, all right? Don't get off on a tangent without me. Make sure that what you're hearing before you flat it out there, that it's correct from the Bible, from God, so on and so forth, and I'll be the first one to be your cheerleader that day. Amen. Amen. But make sure it's from God. The point is, I believe in this church, God wants everybody to have their ear tuned in to yes. God. Yes. God wants all of his sheep in this room, those watching by DVD, listening by CD, everybody that's under the influence of this ministry, God wants to open your ears. God wants to give you an ability to hear from him so that when you read your Bible, you can hear God. somebody help me this morning. When you read your Bible, be able to hear God. Yes. Yes. 
So you'll be able to identify God when he speaks to you, when he's trying to deal with your personal issues, when he's trying to take away those habits, those ways, that pattern, that, that thought pattern, when he's trying to prune those things out from you that are holding you back, that are inhibiting you and inhibiting the progress and the fruitfulness of your growth and maturity in Christ. Let him cut that off. Sometimes it hurts. Yes. Uh -huh. Sometimes you can feel the surgical cut. But God said this is holding you down and it's holding you back and it's got to go. Amen. Some of us play possum with God. What's that? What's that? Can't hear you. You know full well you can hear what you say. But it's like, what, 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 God can't hear what, 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 we pretend like we don't hear you. Remember when you were a kid? We did that with mom and dad. What was that? I didn't hear you. What? Clean what? Do what? We know full well what we've been asked to do, but we play possum with God like we did our parents. Same thing when you go to work. We pretend that we didn't hear the boss. <laughs> when we're stopped by a police officer and we didn't see the stop sign we play blind while we're driving let me tell you this today God wants to pop open your ears so that you can be sensitive sensitive to what God is speaking both into your heart to bring you to that place of destiny so that you will have Christ likeness in you your heart will be transformed the glory of God will be indelibly imprinted in your heart and in your life God wants to speak to you to where the most important thing in your life will be Jesus and the church because you can't separate the two. I love Jesus, but I can't stand those church people. I'm sorry. You're still out of it. You still haven't heard right yet. No, 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 no. You're playing possum. You can't love the head without the body. Right. I've given you an illustration before, and I'll say it quickly again. When I married Diane, I didn't marry just her head. I can just see her head coming with two little Peter Patter feet coming down the aisle. Here, Diane, come on. You can not have it. Yeah, I'm not a baby. Can't stand your body. Sorry, honey. I just, I just can't handle those toes. You know, I just can't handle those. You know, if you just had a nicer, uh, you know, or a, and a more attractive. But your head, I love your head. <laughs> I can just see the preacher saying, and you'll be like, do you take this head to be your lawfully wedded wife? <laughs> When I married Diane, I got the body with the head. When you come to Jesus, you get the body Amen. with the head. You can't separate the two. God wants to give us ears to hear what God is speaking to you and what God is speaking to the body of believers. Where is this church headed? What is God's plan and purpose? What is the destiny of this church? And folks, after 16 years, we have barely begun. We have barely scratched the surface for what God has planned for this body of believers. Let me prophesy this to you even now. I speak prophetically before you in the name of the Lord. There's going to come a time in this church that people are going to travel far and wide just to attend a communion service in this church. Amen. Because even for the communion service, we have seen nothing yet. That's right. Because of what God is speaking, what God is moving, they're going to see, they're going to hear, and they're going to speak about what God's doing here. How do I know that? Because God told me, number one. Number two, we see that Paul writes to the Thessalonians. He said, the popularity or the infamous faith that you have 
has been widespread throughout all of Asia. Everybody's talking about you, Thessalonica. All you Christians in the Thessalonians area. The whole Asia area, all the churches, everybody's talking about you. Not because you're bad, but because of your faith. You receive the word not as coming from man, but as coming from God. Not only did Paul preach prophetically, but they had, are you hearing me this morning, prophetic ears. He said, you receive the word not as coming from Gil Bellic, but coming from God. So that means that your ears have to be as prophetic as my message. A prophetic word is not merely to predict the future, but more importantly, is to speak what Jesus would speak in this hour that we're here today. That's a prophetic message. Thus saith the Lord this hour. So there's two things that Satan doesn't want you to do. Two things that Satan doesn't want you to do. Watch now. One, he doesn't want you to hear from God. Secondly, he doesn't want you to speak on God's behalf. Well, Y'all can't even say amen right. Get with it. I said, amen. God, I said, God wants you to speak on his behalf. He wants to have your tongue. Look, there's two things Satan doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to hear from God. Well, Charlie, that's a threat to him. Yes. Well, it's there. Well, if all those Christians at Calvary Community Church start hearing from God, oh my God, oh, my. oh hell going to break loose. We're going to fall apart. Good. Hallelujah. Fasten your seatbelt, Satan. We're coming at you. Amen. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. I believe Amen. that God wants to open your ears. Satan doesn't want, he wants you to stay deaf. He wants you to stay a mute. He wants you to shut up. He doesn't want you to speak on God's behalf. Amen. People who at one time thought the idea that God speaking to the heart was so remote and so distant and so preposterous even that when they began to hear from the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They know my voice, my voice. If you've got an ear to hear, Jesus has a message. Yes. It'll be personal, it'll be collective. Secondly, Satan doesn't want you to speak for God. That's right. Amen. And it looks Amen. like for some of us, Satan's doing a better job. Amen. Mm -mm. Amen or ouch. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Today we're breaking the devil's back. I want to pray. I want to ask God to unstop your ears so that you can hear what the Spirit has to say. Secondly, I pray right now that God will loosen your tongue. There you go. Amen. But that tongue cannot be loosened until your deafness ends. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for this service. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. <clears throat> Thank you for the power of the word that we have heard this morning. <clears throat> this miracle. And we call it a liberating touch of God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, at the end of this message, the end of this service that we will hear what the Spirit has to say. And that we will speak the oracles of God. Speak the words of God. For Lord Jesus, you say in your word, I speak that which I hear my Father say. And I do that which I hear my, what I see my Father do. Father, in Jesus' name, touch our hearts. As every head is still bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to challenge you this morning. To check your heart. Maybe there's wax in your ears. Maybe there's a congestion in your ear channels. That your hearing is not as clear as it should be. Maybe your tongue 
has been stifled. Whatever it is, I'm going to ask you to challenge you right now. If you feel that you can have a better ear for God, and you want Him to unstop your ears today, so that you can hear Him in your heart, would you raise your hand right now? Thank you. Throughout this room, God bless each and every one. So that you can hear God in your heart. Amen. And then listen to Him. Do as He instructs you. And He will teach you the ways of righteousness. He will show you what's more important in your life. And I know for those of you, pretty much everybody in this room raised their hand. And I know that when I pray this prayer, God's going to touch your soul, your heart, your ears, your spiritual ears. You'll be able to discern God. You'll be able to know God better. You'll be able to hear Him when He speaks to you. When we hours of the morning, it might be early in the morning. It might be in the midday. It might be in the evening with your family. It might be in the, in, at nighttime at the midnight hour. It might be during the service, and I know he will every time there. It might be within the fellowship of one or two believers. It might be in a restaurant, lunch period somewhere. It might be in school, at work. It might be at play. But have your ear tuned in to what God speaks. Because God speaks all the time. Father, in the name of Jesus, today I ask you, open these eyes. Open these ears. Unstop the deafness. And all that has hindered the hearing of the word the hearing of the voice we break it in the name of Jesus and I pray that in the instant and moment that our hearts are opened for Jesus for more room in our hearts for him that our tongue will be loosed in the name of Jesus to speak those things of God Father we no longer want to play possum. We want to be real with God. We want to be real with the body of Christ, the church. Forgive us where we have failed ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, where we have failed you. We don't want to miss one thing that God has for us. We want all of it. I want you to join your neighbor's hand quickly. Join your neighbor's hand where you are. And by his trust, we are healed. Some of you need a healing touch in your body today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these blessed saints. To the glory of God, by the will of God, I pray in Jesus' name for every physical ailment, for every weakness, forever, for every crippling effect in the body. In the name of Jesus, be healed by the power of God. <clears throat> May the life of God flow through each person even now life of the Holy Spirit the healing touch of Jesus there's healing in the blood of my Savior receive it now as you walk Lord, along the shores of Galilee he's the same yesterday In the blood for me. Are you receiving it this morning? Where well, there's healing in the blood of my Savior. As he walked along the shores of Galilee. He's the same, yes he is, yesterday and forever. Well, there's healing in the blood for me. Let's everybody stand right now.
I want you to clap your hands to Jesus and scream loud, I receive it. Can you do it right now? Clap your hands to Jesus. me in mind of when I was doing evangelistic work and I preached revivals and whatnot <laughs> and I felt like I was on the old gospel tent revival crusade back back in the days back 50 years ago but I feel Jesus in this place today I feel Jesus here hallelujah would you find somebody and just hug their neck and say I feel Jesus Somebody show me where Jocelyn is. Where's Jocelyn at? She just is Jocelyn out. nearby? Where's Jocelyn? We're going to have Jocelyn come and recite our Shema before us. Lead us in the closing Shema. How many glad we're in church this morning? All right. How many going to 